Welcome to the second meeting of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work <coughs> Committee for 2019. Um, I would remind everyone to turn their electrical devices to silent. Uh, item one is a decision by the committee to take items four, five and six in private. Are we agreed? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Now, this morning we turn to budget scrutiny with the Minister for Energy, Connectivity and the Islands, Paul Wheelhouse, who is here this morning together with Sue Cairns, Deputy Director for the Consumer and Low Carbon Division, and Neil Ritchie, Head of Energy Company Services, the Low Carbon Division in the Scottish Government. So, welcome to the three of you. And uh, I'll invite the Minister to make a brief opening statement. Thank you very much, Convener, and because uh, it's uh, my first appearance in the new year, can I wish uh, all committee members a happy new year, if it's not too late to do that. Um, I'm pleased to be here today to support the, the committee's draft budget scrutiny. Um, clearly, Convener, Scotland is uh, an energy-rich nation, and that wealth of energy resources provides significant opportunities for supporting uh, sustainable economic growth and our national well-being. A successful energy system not only provides the means to deliver against uh, the energy trilemma to uh, secure, uh, have secure, reliable and affordable energy, low carbon energy sources, but it provides important contributions to the Scottish Government's priorities such as economic development, tackling fuel poverty and responding to climate change. We have just passed the first anniversary since I published the first energy strategy for Scotland. In the spring, we'll publish the first annual energy statement showing the progress to date. I intend to publish our Electricity and Gas Network's vision statement later this month, which will take into account latest data. Uh, the energy strategy itself sets out our ambitions with regard to both energy generation and use. Uh, not all of the powers are currently devolved to the Scottish Parliament, of course, uh, but through financial support, uh, planning policy, uh, our wider influence and a range of devolved policy responsibilities, we have significant scope to champion uh, the energy agenda. Uh, I look forward to updating the committee on the delivery of Scotland's uh, energy strategy, and one strand of that is the ambition for the establishment of a public energy company. And I very much welcome the committee's re recent constructive report. Uh, I can assure the committee that we will take the committee's views into our thinking as we go forward. Uh, the public energy company will be at the centre of the energy strategy's delivery. It can be a vehicle for delivering and supporting many of the strategy's outcomes. Uh, such as tackling fuel poverty, supporting economic development and contributing to mitigating the risk of damaging climate change. Uh, through its public sector ethos, it can be a way of positioning the consumer and communities rather than profit maximisation uh, at the centre of our energy transition. And we have engaged with local authorities uh, to develop this approach and I'm keen that we develop the concept jointly through partnership and co-design with our local government partners. Uh, we intend that the completed outline business case will add substance to our development of next steps and a substantive proposal for consultation. It allows us to ac assess the commercial, financial and economic case, and given the current recent dynamics of the energy supply market, we believe this is essential. However, I'm clear that given the potential outcomes, we cannot wait until 2021 to see if the current price cap is able to deliver uh, fuel poverty improvements, and I have uh, some con concerns that it's led to unintended consequences. Uh, to reiterate, uh, I'm grateful for your positive constructive report and look forward to working with the committee to de deliver the potential from Scotland's uh, considerable energy opportunities. Um, but I'm aware there's a, a range of interest today in terms of the budget and I'm glad to answer questions as best I can. Right, thank you. Um, just, a, just a question for me to start off. Um, if members of the public view this or have the impression this is just going to be another quango that costs taxpayers money, um, what's your response to that? I'm um, certainly always mindful of those concerns. Uh, we, I, know, I know from previous work that the uh, former Finance Secretary John Swinney did to try and rationalise the number of uh, quangos and, and non-government organisations that we, we take those steps forward to create new bodies uh, you know, with great, great care uh, so that we don't create unnecessarily new, new bureaucracy. The intention here is really to try and uh, deliver uh, on the twin aims that the First Minister set out in October of 2017 around delivering against fuel poverty and at, uh, delivering something that will actually add value in that context to how we actually uh, uh, can, can deliver uh, on the fuel poverty agenda but also contribute to economic development. And um, I believe that uh, obviously the outline business case will be critical in that in establishing the role that a public energy company can provide in uh, what is obviously quite a busy landscape in terms of the number of energy providers that we have already available for customers, but what, what different role would that provide? Uh, obviously being able to 
take forward our approach, which is not about profit maximisation, but is about delivering uh, the best result for, for, for those customers as we can and doing the best we can to integrate uh, efforts around energy efficiency uh, and to deliver a good service for customers. We hopefully could carve out a niche uh, which would be uh, an important one in the market and could deliver uh, improved services but also uh, internalise any um, profit margins to deliver lower prices for consumers. Right. Um, Gordon MacDonald. Thank you very much, Convener. Uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, community and locally owned energy targets. Um, the government had a target of one gigawatt by 2020 and two gigawatts of 2030. And I understand that the next annual report of the Energy Saving Trust is supposed to say that uh, we've hit 706 megawatts uh, at June 2018. Can you tell us if the government's still on track to hit its targets? Uh, well, certainly uh, the initial uh, point I would make is that we've already increased the ambition and targets for 2020 and for 2030. So originally we had a target for half uh, a gigawatt and we exceeded that, so we actually upped the target. Uh, but we're all, uh, at present, uh, um, Mr McDonald is absolutely right, we're expecting that we're about 70% of that 2020 target at the moment. Um, I appreciate the point that uh, we've had a 6% increase in last year, which is always welcome, but clearly we need to uh, increase the rate of growth of community mm -hmm. renewables against a, a backdrop where there's um, a change in the UK-wide regime around uh, <coughs> feed-in tariffs, and we're obviously keen to feed into the, uh, the consultation, UK government's consultation on um, looking at uh, support for exporting energy from small, uh, small community uh, generators to, to the grid to try and ensure that there's uh, adequate support mechanisms in there to stimulate that activity. It's very important to us, it's very important to those communities who developed it. Uh, so there are some headwinds uh, that we're operating in at the moment, um, but we're still optimistic that we're on, on, on track to deliver significant growth. We're aware that there's about 882 megawatts of community and uh, locally owned projects in the system. Not, not all of them will be community projects under the definition. Uh, but uh, if you take them together with the 697 megawatts we know of, and hopefully we will exceed 700 megawatts soon, uh, then that takes us up to almost 1.6 gigawatts. So we've still got work to do to get to the 2 gigawatt target by 2030, and clearly we're up against pressure with the headwinds I described uh, in re reaching the 20, revised 2020 target. Mm -hmm. uh, but nonetheless, we're pressing on with that and doing the best we can through CARES uh, to try and stimulate that, because mm -hmm. uh, it's very important to us. In, in terms of the feed-in tariffs that you mentioned, uh, the UK government announced in 2015 that it was going to end by April 2019. And Aberdeenshire Council has certainly said that reductions in feed-in tariff uh, have meant that it's very difficult to make wind and hydro pod projects financially viable. What impact has that announcement had on the pipeline of projects? Well, I mean, it's... Uh as, as all such changes in policy, it creates a, a little bit of uncertainty for those who are planning projects. I know there was great concern about it. We fed in on behalf of uh, the smaller and community uh, sector, I feel like smaller project and community sector, to the UK government's uh, work around feed-in tariff that we thought it would be a mistake to, to lose feed-in tariffs. And we have made uh, inquiries about whether you know there's any scope for Scottish Scottish Parliament, Scottish Government to do something of our own. But clearly, that'll be something we'll we'll try and discuss with UK ministers going forward. But they they have uh, announced plans for a um, a guarantee scheme for for revenues uh, that are being uh, for for um, uh, local and community projects to export to the grid, and they're obviously going to be consulting on that. We'll feed into that and try and influence it in as positive way as we can mm -hmm. for Scotland. But there's no doubt the loss of feed-in <coughs> tariff, which is very popular mechanism and is one that is still similar schemes used around around Europe um, is uh, is something that's potentially damaging to the interests of the community uh, sector and uh, will present a headwind for us. Uh, we don't have direct control over that intervention clearly because that is a reserve power but uh, we're trying to influence that as best we can and make sure that um, Scotland's needs are are represented in the discussions that UK government take forward with the industry. Yeah, given that the, the feed-in tariffs end in April 2019 has there been any indication of, of when any new scheme will come in? You know, the, the trade press on um, renewable energy has suggested it might not come in until 2025. 
I'm certainly uh, concerned concern about um, any delay for a successor scheme, but if I may, Convener, with your indulgence, bring in Sue Kearns, who's, who's close to this, in terms of negotiation with um, uh, Bayes officials, and maybe ask Sue just to comment on the detail of the consultation of that. I think, well, the consultation's um, just live now, so it's um, very young, so we'll have to take some time to look at that. But I think um, one thing that we haven't spoken about here and is quite important is the opportunity for shared ownership. Um, and that's certainly one of the focuses that we've put into the care scheme um, with commercial schemes still ongoing um, and developing that we want to make sure that communities get a chance to buy into those schemes. And that's where we think there's a huge prize for community ownership in the future. And we're working very hard to encourage developers to allow communities those opportunities. Okay. If I may, if I may add something briefly to, to what um, Sue has said there, just to, to add, add to that. We um, certainly have expectations that by 2020, 21 um, uh, year that we would be seeing half of all planning applications involve the shared revenue element. And in my discussions with developers, most are looking at shared revenue um, options for communities at local level. So that may, for example, mean 10% uh, or more uh, of a project being owned by the community. And that's uh, something that we would be keen to support through CARES, uh, Community and Renewable Energy uh, Scheme, uh, to uh, which we, we fund communities with feasibility work and pre-investment uh, pre, pre advice. And then um, we can access funds through, through the EIF. Um, uh, potentially to, to support uh, communities with the capital funding they need to, to invest in projects. But clearly where there's a, an ability to take a, a shared revenue um, element out of a project, that increases the, the uh, sense of ownership literally and, and uh, in, in terms of the effect on the community over a project and feels more, more satisfying from their point of view, but certainly from a policy point of view be more satisfying for us to see projects where there's a significant community um, investment and therefore benefit from the revenues from those projects. Uh, and uh, discussions with developers are encouraging. It's not always possible to find a local community group who will be uh, willing to take on that role of taking a share in a renewable project. But, and we can help through CARES and Local Energy Scotland to try and build up local capacity to take on that role. Um, but you can appreciate where there's uh, sparse populations or communities already feel overstretched with different groups that they're involved with. But sometimes there could be a reluctance to take on a major capital project of this kind. Mm -hmm. uh, but we'll do everything we can to support those communities to, to give them the option. OK, thanks very much. Thank you. Um, Minister, from figures we've seen, uh, it shows that community energy at 11 per cent represents a fairly small proportion of the total. What steps are you taking to address that? Um, it's a very important fact. I mean, we need to be, you know, obviously open and honest about the figures, and uh, hope that uh, you know, if, if the committee hasn't really got them, we can give a breakdown of the the total figure, the the 697 that I referred to. And um, uh, you're absolutely right that um, Mr. Beattie is absolutely right that um, about 11 percent of the total is um, community energy. So it is a relatively small proportion. There are some significant projects uh, in the pipeline, such as Viking in, in, in Shetland, which I know is not universally popular. Uh, not pretending it is, but it is half owned by the community and therefore there could be um, in excess of 300 megawatts of community ownership in that one project alone, which would be a significant benefit. But we will continue to support communities through CARES to develop their renewable energy projects and to st take a stake in commercial projects, uh, whether through shared ownership or or overall ownership of the project, where it's economically viable for them to do so. And we're mindful of the transitional phase we're currently experiencing following the removal of the UK uh, government subsidies uh, through the feed-in tariff and the likely complexity of projects uh, coming forward. So through CARES and Local Energy Scotland, we'll continue to work as closely as we can with the communities involved, uh, tailoring the advice and support according, uh, accordingly with a, a view to ensuring communities remain engaged in our low-carbon uh, transition and meet their long-term needs and aspirations. And we very much recognise, and I think this is beginning to, to land with UK ministers too, that there's a, a really significant uh, regeneration impact that these projects can have at local level. So I'm sure we've all seen good examples of projects where uh, communities are, are seeing uh, investment in physical infrastructure and in terms of the, the skills uh, of, of local young people, for example, who've been supported in some cases, I think uh, in Tolster and Western Isles, for example, uh, with support, additional support of students to go off island to study in the mainland uh, to make that easier for them to do that. So there's very practical ways in which these projects help regeneration, social and physical, in, in local communities. Which projects in particular do you think, or at least which uh, technologies in particular, do you think have the most potential 
to transform community energy? Well, I think um, certainly at this moment in time, it's um, it's a combination of the fact that energy sources such as wind are extremely cheap by comparison with other generation sources, uh, and therefore that's good for the consumer in terms of the, the buyer of electricity that they're they're getting a relatively cheap electricity being generated. But it's also a, a stable known technology that is relatively low risk from a or regarded as low risk from a uh, a finance point of view. Therefore, it's easier to. Uh, attract finance to community projects uh, where there's um, onshore wind projects, for example. Um, solar is also a, a good technology for communities, relatively good returns on, on investment and low, low cost um, uh, of energy as well. So you know, you've got a ready market there for, for that energy uh, where there's a, um, it's actually keeping the overall price down for consumers, whereas you've got more expensive technologies, whether they are in some cases new renewable technologies or in the case of technologies such as, as nuclear, they are relatively expensive. Uh, per megawatt hour. So um, clearly, we wouldn't expect communities to have a nuclear power station, but um, uh, uh, but uh, but certainly um, onshore wind is a really good technology for many projects uh, across the country. We've also got small hydro projects, uh, where Scotland has almost 80% of the UK total of small-scale hydro projects. Pro probably in, in main because of our topography and our terrain. Um, lending itself to that, but also we've got a very strong culture of communities uh, pursuing projects in that sector, and that's been a good a good earner for uh, local communities in, uh, across the country, uh, particularly in the west and north of, of Scotland. Um, and uh, we're keen to, to see the UK policy changes not dent that uh, that very strong profile we have in community-owned onshore wind and hydro projects. Do you consider that uh, the resources available are being appropriately targeted? To ensure the maximum development of these technologies. Um, well, we, we we are obviously doing our best uh, to to ensure that we, from from our from our point of view, um, target resources to areas where it can have biggest impact. Clearly, we're trying to support new and emerging technologies such as wave and tidal as well, which we do believe in the longer term will have particular resonance for communities in, in our coastal and, and island areas. Uh, and uh, I think the combination of things like battery storage uh, could be really um, transformational, making some of the projects um, viable through the concept of arbitrage. Um, uh, there are uh, uh, projects being taken forward, for example, by Nova Innovation, which is a Scottish-based company based in Leith, uh, in the Shetland Islands, where they are combining a uh, Tesla battery. Um, it's the first one installed in uh, I believe in the UK, a um, uh, good scale battery with uh, a tidal project, and that could be uh, demonstrating the concept of a technology like tidal could make a significant breakthrough in its on its economics as we get production volumes up that that improve the sort of Henry Ford style uh, improve the economies of scale in the manufacturing process. You will start to see the cost, what they call the levelised cost of energy, the cost per megawatt hour tumble as the capital cost of the equipment drops as more of these uh, machines are made. So I think it's it's where we are at the moment in time. Technologies like wind and solar are and hydro are, are absolutely the mainstay of, of community projects. But in the future, I would hope te newer technologies, such as um, uh, tidal uh, in the early stages, wave in the longer term, may prove also to be um, attractive to communities. And clearly, we have, with remote island wind, significant community interest in, in the project in, in Viking and also potentially projects in Orkney and the Western Isles as well. So uh, there's across a range of technologies, but I'm conscious that my colleague Sue Kearns wanted to come in on that point, if, if I may uh, bring that up. No, yeah, in terms of um, projects in the future, I think um, we should also think about um, the, some of the innovation schemes that we're funding, um, looking at local energy systems, because a lot of community groups are involved in, in those projects. These can be quite complex, and I have to, uh, I will say quite honestly that, you know, we have to look for commerciality in these different forms of systems, and we're not fully there yet, but I think they hold potential for the future where communities are looking like, ministers mentioned, you know, the storage scheme with marine energy. We're looking about combinations of technologies rather than just one single technology, and I think they're the answer to the future, bringing in um, local revenue. And also the other side is around heat and energy efficiency, and we're already seeing quite a lot of appetite from community groups. Um, in some cases where they've already got um, electricity, renewable electricity schemes, but they're looking in the future to get involved in um, Scotland's energy efficiency programme. Um, so they're, they're trying to um, get involved in heat, energy efficiency, and they want to see what they, that can bring to their community. And I think that's really important to encourage that um, interest. I think, I think that's very helpful. And, and if I may, convene, I just add one point, which actually partly answers your first question in this session as well. You know, what could a public energy company do that's different? And um, 
while we don't have firm plans on this, I would like to think that in the longer term, through the uh, progression of our project jointly with local government, there could be scope for involving local energy generation in terms of selling that electricity through the white label process to uh, to our customers if we do develop a public energy company. So it could be a way in which we can either supplement or, or, or um, uh, substitute for the lack of a feed-in tariff regime to be able to provide a market for that community-owned uh, local, ener local energy uh, provision across Scotland. But that's very much a let's have a look if there's a possibility. We haven't yet got a, a firm answer on that question yet as, as we're early in the process, but it's something I'd like to get answers for as to what a public energy company could add in terms of supporting that. Right. I'll come to John Mason now. Uh, thanks, Convener. Well, you mentioned the publicly owned energy company, and that's what we wanted to ask you about. Is there anything in the budget for 1920? I realise we're quite an early process, but is there anything actually in the budget for next year? I mean, I, th I think uh, at this stage, we're certainly obviously um, uh, providing support for the development of the business case at this moment in time. But uh, in terms of specifics, uh, it would be um, wrong to suggest we've, we've got a significant um, funding stream in identified in the in the budget for that. Um, the information that we uh, present in the budget would uh, suggest, obviously, that we would, uh, as we take forward uh, the answers that are developed by the consultants in the business case, we would obviously have to respond to that in terms of providing identified funding streams to, to implement uh, the outcomes of the study. So, right, so for 1920, it would be basically just covered by normal... Yeah, we're, we're, we're dealing with the cost of developing the business case, absolutely, yeah. but in terms of actually investment in a public energy company, that until we've got an answer as to whether it's a viable uh, project for the government to proceed with on behalf of people of Scotland, we, we haven't identified a specific funding strand, that would probably be in the next year's budget. Right, so probably 2021 yes. and then maybe increasing after that. Is it something that you think there will always be a kind of budgetary input into, or would it be something that's revenue neutral in the longer term? I, th I think the, the, the aspiration, obviously, I'm very aware that, um, certainly in my ongoing discussions with uh, other uh, established energy providers, that margins are pretty tight. Um, but what we would be seeking to operate is a is, is a model that, that was not, you know, obviously a, a, an albatross around the neck for, for the taxpayer, but clearly could um, cover its costs, uh, but by operating differently on a kind of not-for-profit basis, as the First Minister set out, there's opportunities to, um, uh, rather than having to obviously see funds leave the business and in the form of share returns to shareholders, we'd also be able to retain that uh, that that uh, resource and then channel that back into the company. So what we're looking at through the business case is, um, first of all, is this a viable proposition? We wouldn't want to land uh, the people of Scotland with something which was a, a significant um, drain on, on public resources. I would hope that it can wash its face, um, but that we can do so in a way which actually provides additional value for consumers in tackling fuel yeah. poverty and um, uh, having That's a, right. I mean, it was, just, it was really the point about would it impact the budget, so you've answered that, so yeah. thanks very much. Uh, Thank you, uh, Convener. Minister, you, you mentioned that the viability of the energy company is still being reviewed. What timeline are you working towards to establish whether it will be viable or not? Uh, well, we, um, in terms of the the uh, funding and the timings of that, um, we are obviously um, developing the Outland business case. I'll, I'll ask um, my colleague Neil Ritchie, if I can, who's in charge of that, to, to give details around the, the timing when the uh, consultants will be coming back to Scottish Government with their initial report, and obviously will uh, be our intention to share the findings of that with, with, the, with the Chamber. If I may, can we just bring Mr Ritchie in? Yes, just to add to what the Minister said, the uh, timeline we're working to is to receive the consultant's outline business case towards the end of March, uh, which case we'll publish that in line with a, a consultation to seek wider views as to the conclusions of that report and uh, our assessment with local authorities as to uh, questions such as what should the energy company do, what should it not do, and actually clarity on the vision which is, I think, a, a point that comes back to the Committee's report needing to have a very clear objective for what we're trying to do. Uh, it's worth emphasising the point for me to, to, to Mr Lockhart and, and other colleagues that um, it's not just words, we, warm words. We are really keen to work with local government on this, and so they, their view on um, you know, the attractiveness to them and uh, to, to local government partners will obviously be critical in our decision in terms of how we progress. And based on the analysis you've done so far, um, how comfortable are you that this will be a viable proposition? Um, 
We will obviously we'll not know the, in, in hard terms until we've got the report from, from the consultants, and even then we'll obviously need to seek feedback on it. But we do believe that there's, a, there's an opportunity here to work with local government. Clearly, uh, we're aware of a number of local authorities that either are in the process of already doing so or have, um, have, 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 have voiced uh, an interest in creating their own uh, local energy supply companies, areas like Highland, for example, that are now progressing plans. Um, Aberdeen Heat and Power, obviously, is, is something that's already well established. Um, we're aware of other local authorities that have got an interest in this. And what we're trying to do is um, uh, take advantage of the, the, uh, the interest there is around local government to work with local government partners to hopefully have an overarching um, uh, brand which is bigger than the sum of its parts, if you like, so we can use the marketing power of a, a national um, uh, brand to help drive activity at a local level to um, local energy supply companies and work in partnership with local government to do that. So we think the, the concept is sound. We certainly, it seems to have been um, you know, independently uh, determined through your own report that there's, there's, there's potentially a, an attractive model there to take forward. Um, we don't yet know until, we won't know until the consultants come back to the report. We'll have to um, trust their professional judgment as to uh, the, the commercial viability of it. It's obviously a very challenging environment at the moment for local energy supply companies. We'd have to acknowledge that. And we've seen a number of uh, younger companies going to the wall in recent months, as I'm sure, sure you're aware, uh, something of concern to us. Uh, we certainly sympathise with why the uh, price cap has been brought in the market. We understand why the, the UK government have done that. Uh, we are concerned there may be unintended consequences, although we've raised those issues with, uh, with Ms Perry and her colleagues, um, just to be mindful of the impacts having the market. And we'll obviously have to take into account uh, the impact of uh, the price cap and other, and other um, market factors at the time we make a decision, whenever that is, uh, uh, what, the, what the environment is at that time. Okay. Just a brief follow-up, uh, please. Uh, as you mentioned, public energy companies elsewhere in the UK have struggled. Uh, Portsmouth uh, Local Authority have recently decided to abandon their plans. Uh, I believe Bristol Energy posted a loss of £8.4 million last year, clearly showing that these companies uh, do come at a cost. Uh, what lessons will the Scottish Government take from the challenges faced elsewhere by public energy companies? Well, we, the first thing is to say that we are certainly trying to learn from it. I know uh, Neil and, and other colleagues in the team have been engaging with like Robin Hood Energy and other uh, uh, companies which are up and running uh, in the UK to, to try and understand uh, the challenges we face. Clearly, we're learning a lot from the interaction with um, those companies who have entered difficulty that are in Scotland that we're, we're trying to support. We've obviously had recent issues with Spark Energy and, and other providers that are finding life pretty tough. And indeed, it's fair to say that the, even the big six are, are finding some of the, the, the market conditions uh, tougher than perhaps they have been in recent years because margins are being squeezed. So we are very much alive to that. Um, we need to understand, uh, to, to address both your point and, and Mr Mason's point, you know, if we do proceed with a public energy company, will it be on the basis that it's, um, it's uh, not to the detriment of, of wider public funding commitments? Uh, and clearly that's a, a, a calculated decision we'll have to make once we've got the full information before us. But I want to reassure uh, Mr Locker and, and the committee, very much mindful of the need to act responsibly here and to make sure that we take sound decisions. And we'll do all the due diligence, of course, you'd expect of us before we take any decision. Thank you. Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you very much, um, Convener. Uh, just a brief question, picking up on what you talked about earlier about community shares in commercial schemes. Is, is that, to, to be clear, is that a new element you're proposing for CARES or is that an element that's already can be supported? Uh, CARES are already active in that space and advising communities, but we, what we want to see is to see, um, uh, Mr Whiteman is right to raise it, um, we want to see that grow. Uh, we, we think it's, um, it'd be fair to, to, to reflect on the fact that in the current environment where there's no uh, proposed new pot one auction for, for onshore wind uh, projects, for example, established technologies, uh, including onshore wind, um, from the UK government, then it does mean that we have to be mindful of the fact uh, the financial environment has changed significantly for onshore wind developers. And while there are a number of uh, means by which they can address that in terms of obviously larger uh, wind turbines extending the, the length of planning consents so to give more investor certainty, uh, other, other measures that, that can be taken forward, we believe um, uh, one area whereby we can continue to see significant community um, benefit in a broader sense from, from onshore wind projects would be for the community to take on a shared revenue new model as a perhaps a, a more attractive alternative for the developer that there's a sharing of risk if you like the, the community involved and we have to be careful to give the community the best advice possible so they don't take on risks unnecessarily that that may damage their interests but assuming that that is a, a positive position uh, for the community then to, to support them going forward with uh, with projects that allow them to co-invest with a developer 
hopefully in many cases that will be the community itself uh, doing the entire project as we've seen some great examples uh, across the country um, but also there'll be circumstances where they'll be co-investing with a, a larger developer or, or, or landowner in the local area and so we'd be keen to do that. Uh, we are, uh, I should be, should be saying, we're, we're currently consulting on revisions to good practice principles that we have uh, established which the uh, largely associated with the £5,000 per megawatt figure that you may be familiar with. Um, we have a community uh, register as well, so developers can post what uh, community benefit they are, are providing to communities. But we believe that shared revenue may be um, uh, an attractive model for developers going forward, rather than the traditional means of, of supporting communities through community benefit payments. OK, thanks. Um, I want to ask a question about fuel poverty and energy efficiency in Warmer Homes Scotland, but I'm aware that's not in your portfolio. I get frustrated that energy... Is split across portfolios, but Warmer Homes Scotland has got a £3 million budget cut from 27 to 24. I'm just wondering, in the context of a broader budget that is increasing, why that was. But if you can't answer that, I'll. The detail answer. that would obviously be for Mr. Stewart, but yep. I would just, just say that we, we do regard sort of energy efficiency obviously a very high priority. So across the piece in total, we are spending half a billion on, on energy efficiency mm -hmm. measures. So uh, I appreciate that's not dealing with a specific issue that Mr. White I'll, raises, but, I'll raise that with but Mr. we Stewart. are. That would yep. be more appropriate, uh, uh, okay. obviously, as, as Mr. Stewart's in, response in, to that department. I think you indicated earlier the next annual report on. Cares is due to be published imminently. Does that is that like next month or in two if months? Can we ask Sue about the publication date? I believe. Um, I'm not sure about that to be honest, but um, yes, it, if, it, if you're saying it's imminent, you're probably right that it's imminent. We've certainly got the figures. We've got the figures, okay. Mm -hmm. And I just want to move on because I had some difficulty in getting hold of the um, data from the Energy Savings Trust, but eventually did get a table of all the recipients of. Um, Schemes, and I'm just wondering, will that be routinely published? You probably had difficulty because of data protection, so it's a matter of what has to be redacted when in the information that they give you, um, because some of these schemes are, are individuals owning them. So I think that would probably just be the issue there. But I'll look into that for you. Okay, so it can be published. Thanks. And <clears throat> in the 2017 report, Energy Savings Trust on the community and locally owned renewable energy, um, there's a definition of the locally owned under farms and estates, and it says where the per these are organisations where the person or organisation listed as the applicant in the planning application gives their address as being in Scotland. It goes on to say estate ownership is often difficult to establish, but where possible publicly available information has been used to establish whether estate owners are normally resident on the estate where the installation is to be built. Looking at the data, I found um, a company that's owned by an offshore company, um, an estate that's owned by a family in the Netherlands. Uh, quite a large farm that's owned in Lincolnshire, um, another estate that's owned by someone who lives in Lancashire, Leicester. Um, how rigorously do you explore whether, in fact, these are locally owned? Um, I, I don't know the answer to Mr White's question in terms of the, the, the definition. Obviously, I, um, I take the point entirely. I know he has a long track record of, of being um, uh, very, very good at digging into these, these data, so I trust what he's saying in, uh, entirely has been accurate. Um, in terms of the uh, farms and estates, there's, I think, 280 megawatts in total that uh, is assumed within the 697 megawatts that I quoted. Uh, that's as at December of last year, an energy saving trust figure, so I'm not sure whether that's going to be updated to the 706 uh, megawatts that was referred to earlier. Um, but I, I do take the point entirely. We obviously, um, uh, community and locally owned uh, definition is quite broad in the sense that uh, it's, it's not... Um, uh, focusing down purely on those who live locally and are, are um, uh, in the community on a day-to-day -day basis. So I, I take the point that Mr Whiteman's raising and clearly we need to, to have a look at breaking that down further if we can to show uh, the extent to which there's maybe a, uh, lots of revenues out of the country if that is the point that Mr Whiteman's... Uh, I'm, I'm just wondering that there is a definition about eligibility which talks about Normally, it's the person or organisation listed as the applicant in the planning application, giving their address as being in Scotland. Of course, the applicant in the planning application may not be bear any relation at all to the uh, to the owner. And the other thing is, it, it it implies that information is used to establish whether owners are normally resident. So I'm just wondering why there's a discrepancy between an apparent definition and some of the recipients. So whether either you'll tighten up the um, process of assessing eligibility or if you'll tighten up the definition, or both. I'm happy to come back on, on that point uh, to Mr Whiteman. I think it's important point you raise. Um, we don't want to see 
uh, in any way the policy intention being undermined um, by you know poor policing of, of that point. So um, I'm not saying there is poor policing of it, but we'll look into it and see if we can come back to the committee if that's something that's of interest to the committee, as it seems to be. Um, certainly the, the intent is obviously we're trying to uh, uh, generate projects which benefit the local community and that we see the returns from the investment going into local community to have the <coughs> desired impact in terms of economic development in the local community. If that's not happening, if that's being in any way kind of undermined by the point that Mr Whiteman raises, I'd certainly be keen to look into uh, any of the points he raises today and happy to discuss the detail with them uh, so we can dig into that. Um, uh, we can liaise with Energy Saving Trust about how, how we actually record that and how we uh, make sure that we get um, accurate information. Uh, it's not to, to say that uh, to criticise those who are involved in those projects in any way, shape or form, but obviously we want to ensure that the policy intent is actually being delivered. And so, uh, to some extent, if the, if the benefits are coming to the community and it happens to be an overseas landowner who's got a local agent or whatever, and the local agent is, is what's um, appearing to be the local person in, in this process, as long as the benefits then come back to the community, then obviously that would uh, deliver the policy intent. Um, but we'll, I'm happy to, rather than uh, come up with an, an accurate point, that we're relying on these high-level statistics that we're using here. But we can drill down into it and try and identify if there's a problem to solve there. Okay, and the Certainly other point we're, we're is, big on Sue Kearns as well, who's keen to come back. I'd just ask for clarification on the the ones that you've identified. Are these CARES applicants, or are they just on the EST list as having developed schemes as a farmer or an estate? Because if they're just on the list as being on the the, the overall register within this 700 megawatts, of course they may not be CARES recipients of, of CARES support. Under CARES, that's where obviously they have to show that they're you know, resident in Scotland and they have to provide, farms and estates have to provide a very high level of community benefit in order to qualify for that support under CARES. But if they're not getting any support under CARES and they're just developing their own um, scheme, then obviously um, that's up to them where they live in terms, I'm not sure, I, I can't, I'm, I'm just asking for the clarification there, whether this is an issue under CARES or not. Um, it's, it's, it's not clear whether they all are. I can see that point. Um, this is a database called Colo Map Extract. So these would be things that Energy Saving Trust are. This is data that they are yes, collecting. Yes. So that, that's the full data. So it, you'd have to. That we'd have to double check whether those particular schemes also got support under CARES. Because if they didn't, then obviously we have no control over you know, whether they're developing schemes and wh where they live. That's a planning matter. But if they're, if they're applying for CARES support, then that's when that will come into effect. But the, 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 I take that point. That's a, a use, useful clarification. Um, nevertheless, the definition of um, those bodies that um, uh, the, the categorization of each installation, regardless of whether they get care support, um, that definition seems to be at odds in a few cases with some of the bodies that are on that list. So just as a data capture mm -hmm. thing, never mind the CARES one. But I think that's a very useful clarification. But we'll have, have to look at that, uh, Mr. Wayman and, and, and Camino. Yeah. Um, see if we can come back to the committee yeah. on any detail. And, and the final point is, is there any, in terms of receiving CARES support, is there any evaluation of um, the, the needs of the applicant? I mean, if an applicant is very wealthy, or I mean, are, are they assessed as to their independent wealth is there any if on that point of detail for me refer that to to, to miss kearns again there's an additionality sort of um, um section within the application so they do have to say whether if they're not able if they don't get the support are they able to progress the scheme or not so obviously they answer that um it's meant to be answering that honestly. I'm not sure how much then probing goes into that, but the, the applicant is meant to answer that section to provide the um, assessment of additionality or not. Okay, thanks. Um, Jamie Halko Johnson. Uh, thank you very much, Camille. Good morning. Uh, just a very quick question. Um, Minister, both yourself and Susan Cairns mentioned innovation and sort of innovation, and you mentioned the, the projects in Shetland, and of course you'll be aware of Surf and Turf in Orkney, which I know you visited uh, as well. Um, there is an increasing importance on the storage um, aspect, and I was wondering whether within the budget there that, that importance is, is represented. Uh, absolutely. Um, as uh, Sue has said, you know, we are keen to promote sort of more integrated projects and uh, both Surf and Turf and, uh, and Big Hitter projects I'm, I'm familiar with and we have supported, um, uh, I think, certainly um, pro projects in, the, in, in Orkney Islands involving storage. Um, 
because of the, the grid constraint issue, which we hope will be overcome, um, there's been an opportunity to explore areas like hydrogen uh, as, a, as a storage um, uh, option for for the development of um, hydrogen ferries as well, and we continue to do that. But uh, it may be a subtle point, but we've rebranded re the Renewable Energy um, Investment Fund as, as EIF instead of renewable. So we've, we've moved away from purely renewable, so that was to allow for storage uh, to be included in more integrated uh, projects to be supported. So that's uh, certainly um, EIF is now available for projects which integrate generation and storage. And as Sue is saying, under LCITP and, uh, and other routes, we've been trying to support more integrated projects. So um, there have been examples, uh, and not just North Islands, but elsewhere, where we're using heat batteries. Sonamp, a, a Scottish-based manufacturer, is, is taking for a project um, with uh, Castle Rock Eden Var Housing Association mm -hmm. uh, in the Lothians uh, uh, and Midlothian um, to, to look at... Um, uh, combining solar with with heat battery storage, and then a control group just with with solar to sort of evaluate the impact of having heat storage batteries. So these are areas we're very conscious of that um, that, that that storage is. Uh, Mr. Harker Johnson is right to identify it as an important uh, factor. And as I said earlier, although um, uh, it may not have the high profile of some other projects, the uh, investment that that Nova Innovation and and Tesla are making jointly in their project in the Shetland Islands, I think, is very interesting from the point of view allowing a relatively high cost generation. Uh, technology at this moment because of the manufacturing volumes to uh, sell its electricity through arbitrage at a point when the electricity can be sold in the market at the best price. Um, and uh, so that uh, allows them to overcome the reliance on the wholesale price. And so I think storage can play a number of different roles, not only in that sense, but also balancing the grid. So we're keen to see it um, developed. And as the energy strategy sets out, we're very keen to develop local energy uh, supply and demand relationships. And, uh, and I know the regulator is looking at, at, at that as well in terms of how they can use um, uh, their, their influence to try and support the development of a, a clear local supply and demand relationship uh, across Scotland and the rest of the UK. Um, at the moment, obviously, the this, this scheme is part of um, uh, integrated schemes and pro projects coming forward. Do you see, um, uh, within, either within the budget this year or looking forward, more, or more focused on dedica dedicated storage, uh, standing independently um, as, a, as an area of innovation rather than, as I say, tied into um, integrated systems? If I understand it correctly, yes. I mean, we, we do support, I should stress, um, Scottish Enterprise and Highlands Islands Enterprise are also active in supporting R&D in the area around storage. And obviously, we have the PNDC in Cumbernauld, which is a power networks distribution centre, uh, demonstration centre, sorry, which is um, a research centre, which is uh, trialling battery technology there with support from, uh, from, from enterprise companies and Scottish Government. And so, uh, yes, we look at storage in its own right as well. Uh, but where we see its particular value maybe where it's integrated as part of a wider solution and of course um, we are looking at low carbon transport options where the, the batteries in the vehicles themselves may also play a role in terms of helping to balance uh, grid at peak uh, where, where, where plug-in plug -in vehicles are, are connected to the grid. So I think um, there are a number of routes by which uh, storage could play an important role as we develop a kind of more uh, whole system approach for our energy system. Okay. Thank you, Minister. Well thank you very much Minister and to your officials and I'll conclude this part of the session and suspend the meeting for a changeover of witnesses.
We turn now to item three on our agenda for this morning, and this is to deal with the issue of uh, Scottish Enterprise and Kayam. Now, we ha are joined today uh, by, first of all, Neil Francis, who is the Director of Trade and Investment Operations Scotland for Scottish Enterprise, Jane Pollock, who is the team leader in Global Accounts, Elaine Morrison, Head of Partnerships, and Michael Cannon, who is Head of Innovation Enterprise Services, Scottish Enterprise. Now, I understand, uh, Mr. Francis, you wish to make a brief opening statement. Yes, um, thanks. Sorry, I should say you don't need to press any buttons. Oops. I think I think some of you are here for the first time, so I'm not, no, need I'm to, pressing the buttons. no need to do anything. The mics and everything will be operated by the sound system. So, um, simply, when you're invited to do so, speak. And if you want to come in, simply indicate by raising your hand so that I can bring you in if there's a specific point you want to make in response to a question. Um, so, Mr. Francis. Thank you, Chair. My apologies for not knowing how to operate the system. First of all, can I uh, thank you for inviting us here today, and we appreciate uh, the opportunity for this discussion. Uh, as you'll appreciate, this session was arranged at fairly short notice, and if we're unable to answer any of your questions to the level that you would like, then of course we will follow up in writing or would welcome the opportunity to return to the committee at a different time. I think it is important before we delve into the detail around KIM, uh, I just give, spend a couple of minutes on context. Uh, obviously, Scottish Enterprise, for us, working with companies is a critical part of what we do, uh, as it is the companies at the end of the day that will create the more better jobs that we all wish to see in our economy. And as part of this, uh, we can provide grant assistance uh, to companies through programmes such as RSA uh, to support companies to deliver specific outcomes. And in the case of our uh, RSA, these are outcomes around job creation and uh, investment in capital assets, both of which are important in driving the productivity of our economy forward. Now, when you're working with companies and providing that kind of assistance, there's always an element of risk. At the end of the day, Scottish Enterprise is in the risk business. However, we do always seek to balance risk against the potential outcomes through undertaking appropriate appraisal due diligence and uh, attaching conditions to the assistance we offer companies. However, inevitable there are sometimes cases where the uh, outcomes generated are not what we all wish to see, as we'll discuss later this morning. It is important, though, that this is uh, put into perspective. Uh, over the last five years, uh, through our RSA programme, we have supported uh, 400 companies uh, to make an investment of around one billion into the Scottish economy, creating over 40,000 jobs. So that uh, is a significant uh, area of uh, performance and investment. Uh, in relation to uh, KIAM, our priority, uh, along with our partners, remains to achieve the best possible outcomes for the affected employees and securing uh, a positive future and outcome for the site. As you'll be aware, there are a number of sensitivities and commercial aspects to the project that are still uh, current, and we will respect these in the way we answer your questions today, and I hope you will appreciate that. Uh, the investment and support to KM, or KM, sorry, came at an important junction, uh, juncture in terms of the West Lothian economy. Colleagues uh, or members will recall uh, the closure of the halls of Broxburn uh, facility, and uh, the task force that was established uh, to ensure there was additional economic activity brought to West Lothian in its aftermath. And the investment in KM came about in part 
uh, in relation to the work undertaken by the task force. And my final point, uh, uh, I would just like to uh, remind the committee that last year Rona, Allison, and myself came to the committee and we had a fairly detailed and uh, productive discussion around how SE works with companies in turnaround situations or in distress situations. And I hope that, if members will recall, will provide some useful background to our discussion this morning. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you. I'll turn now to questions from committee members, starting with John Mason. Hey, thanks very much, convener. And I just wonder, by way of introduction, if you could get, maybe give us a little bit of the background of when um, Scottish Enterprise and CAIAM first started having a relationship. I understand before CAIAM there were at least two previous incarnations, I think under different names. I don't know all the legal issues of that. So, I mean, you mentioned just now things happened after the Hall's demise. Um, but was that when the first relationship was, or does it go back further than that? I'll ask my colleague Jane to address that question. Yes, um, we started working with uh, the, com the pre company was Gemfire, and Kayam came in and took over that business in 2013. And we have been, we'd been working with Gem both Gemfire, and, and there was a continuity of support with Kayam coming in to take over the business. So overall, with Kayam, we've been working with them uh, for around about five years. R just to clarify, though, but uh, you had worked with Gemfire before Pre that? Prior to that, yes. So when was the very first time you started with either Gemfire or the other uh, company? That was, uh, I think it, that began in around about 2008. Right, 2008, right, yeah. okay. Just to add to that, the history there is, is, is long and complex. Yeah, I don't want all the details. It started back with a company called Kamata that was a Scottish technology startup. Yes. And that went through a number of, of, of incarnations before it even got to Gemfire. Yeah. Right, well, could we go back to the beginning of the incarnations? When was the first time? So we obviously, I don't have that detailed with me today, but we'll right. clearly follow up in writing. But it was that before 2008 in other yes, words? Yes, yes. Right. Okay, well, that's helpful. And uh, as I understand it, I mean, although this company is American-based, most of the employees are in Scotland, or have been. Um, where were the real decisions made in this company? Were they, were they made in California or made in Scotland or somewhere else? They were made, the, the senior management team predominantly were based in Scotland. The CEO has a base, he has uh, originally Iranian, uh, American, who uh, is based himself over here, and the decisions were made by the senior team led by him. Right, and so a uh, Scottish Enterprise um, staff were able to meet with the most senior decision makers. Absolutely, yes. If needed, necessary. Yeah. Right, okay, that's fine. Thanks very much. Jackie Bailey. You described to me the nature of the support, and I'm thinking in people terms rather than in cash terms, um, that Kayam received from Scottish Enterprise over the last five years. Yes, uh, we uh, worked with them um, on a, an account managed basis, fully account managed through the team, um, with a very highly experienced account manager. Uh, we uh, initially we always have a strategic discussion in the initial stages, looking at all the themes, whether it's innovation, workforce, um, internationalisation, etc., etc. The people element of the business uh, in terms of throughout that period, the, the predominant work that we did was through SMAS, um, which was around about lean principles, uh, helping them to uh, uh, implement efficiencies, um, and there was around about four projects through SMAS that we implemented over the period. Um, and the remaining uh, time, it was always part of the agenda to discuss what further could we be doing on the, in terms of the people development aspects, given the, the, you know, the skills and the talents of the workforce. So there was one account manager in place for the company. Typically, how would that account manager operate with the company? Uh, regular uh, meetings, um, uh, not meetings for meeting's sake ever, uh, really looking at, uh, uh, at having at least once, once a quarter, having an annual review, but also in between times, because businesses operate in cycles. 
So they can be just managing day to day. Uh, but what, what we're always trying to do is to identify any opportunities further for, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, training the workforce, uh, new projects, new new areas of, of investment. So uh, we are, we're, we're having an ongoing dialogue throughout the full that full period, and it involves the account manager leading and bringing in. Uh, so it would it be fair to say the account needed. manager would would have expertise in that area, be quite embedded with the organisation, yes. know everything that was going on with them. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, who was the account manager in this case? Uh, it's uh, well, I, I'd I'd rather I mean the 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 rather not name in a public forum. If, okay. Uh, can you supply that information? Uh, we to the could committee? supply that absolutely That's separately. Fine. Um, now, can I turn to cash? Um, how much public funding, um, it, leaving out regional selective assistance for a moment, but how much public funding, in addition to the regional selective assistance, um, has Kayam received from Scottish Enterprise? I'm thinking of other grants or yes. reliefs, or mm -hmm. indeed, you know, the how much it cost to put an account manager in. In place. Yeah, well, the, the account manager, that's part of Scottish Enterprise policy and, and remit in terms of placing in an account manager to work with but a, it has a business a cost like this. To it. it has a cost to it. Uh, and I'm curious it, to know what that was. Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, we'd, over all the costs of uh, implementing or bringing an account manager, we, would, we can provide that, uh, that back to helpful. you and separately. Yep. In terms of direct financial support for the company, there was around about, I think, about nine and a half thousand through SMAS for um, a range of uh, SMAS-related efficiency projects, which are always tied into, uh, you know, achieving mm -hmm. uh, results and productivity improvements. Okay, and the regional selective assistance, <coughs> if I'm right, was 850,000 previously, and then there was a sum of something like 100,000 more recently. No? Mm -hmm. Good morning. Uh, no, the the, the one hundred thousand was simply an instalment of a, a grant claim. So the the total RSA paid was eight hundred and fifty thousand. Okay. okay. Thank you, convener. Um, may I ask the account manager? Were there a number of account managers over the years from two thousand and eight to date? Yes. Yes. There was uh, the back again. We can reply and investigate. So you, you'll supply us with a list of who these people were. Yes, we can right? do that. Yeah. Um, and why do you not wish to name the person in a public hearing? A, I think it's it's really just in terms of the the work that's that's been done. I mean, we are here to represent Scottish Enterprises as, as the as a as a group. Uh, so you know, I think we can we can name that you know provide those those names on a separate basis. I'm not sure I understand that answer. Um, I mean, the the four of you are here. You're named. You're representing a public body. Um, presumably, the accounts manager works for Scottish Enterprise. Is that right? Yes, indeed. It, it, it hasn't been something we've really considered, but our policy hasn't been to release the names of individuals doing the individual things, but we can reflect on that and, and revert to you in writing, Chair. Right, so that, that's a general policy you have in terms of as far as the I different know, companies you deal with. Yeah. Right. Well, perhaps you can clarify that as well when you yes. provide the list of names. Thank you. Uh, Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, what's your understanding of what went wrong with Kayam in recent years? Uh, essentially, uh, as, a, as a technology company, they were uh, continuously being invested in throughout that period. I think the most recently, uh, in terms of the, the downward price pressures in the, in the market, there's a lot of larger players coming in, um, and ultimately they began to more recently experience cash flow issues. Uh, but through that period of, of their existence, they had continuously been invested in, in terms of a viable investment from, from the private sector. So more recently, it was the, 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 the greatest pressure on them was market conditions changing very, very rapidly. And when did you see the first signs of distress uh, with the business and cash flows? In terms of the cash flow, that was uh, as you know towards the end of the year when we when we initially uh, uh, provided the briefings in terms of the 
uh, during during November because since then they had you know all the support that we'd given they'd met every target they were continuing to invest we were actually also at that time talking to them about other potential opportunities uh, in terms of invest because they were planning ahead the technology that they're you know it's, that they're involved in is highly it moves really really quickly in terms of end-to-end -end data processing so they were they were constantly looking to to invest and, and stay ahead of the market in terms of the products so it was really more recently, the 60th of November was the first sign we had of, of the, 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 the distress that they, they shared with us. Okay, and, and more generally, does Scottish Enterprise have a system of early warning signals, uh, flags that might show early signs of a company being in distress? For, for example, not filing accounts on, on time? Uh, well, filing accounts uh, in terms of the timing of that, uh, you know, it's quite a kind of common in terms of uh, companies maybe not filing absolutely on time. There can be various reasons for that. It's not unusual to do that. The, the early warning signs we might have are, are obviously in terms of, uh, you know, uh, reviewing finances, but also behaviours. So if companies aren't engaging or there's a bit of radio silence or, you know, and if, particularly if there's something that's live, a project that's live, um, and we're looking for, for additional information or updates and, and it goes very quiet. So there's, there's certainly, uh, through the, the, the instincts and the experience of the teams that are involved and the networks that we have that are often engaging with companies, that's when we, you know, we're, we're always open to, to uh, you know, to uh, any, any sort of alerts that, that uh, we might be looking at get on, on the companies that we're working with. I think, just, just to add to that, I think... I it's through our process of engagement that we would generally get early signals. Uh, clearly, that is dependent on the level of trust and confidence the senior management of a company has in their relationship with us. So that's really important. I think that will give us much earlier signals than some of the... Uh, things that are put in the public domain, as you mentioned, late filing of, of accounts, well, that is important. And I think we have a commitment to review whether there is a more systemic approach to how we could identify companies that might potentially uh, come under risk in the future. That's an ongoing piece of work we have. Okay. Because the most recent accounts filed show a pre-tax loss of 20 million in 2016, and presumably that all, those accounts also showed some pressure on cash flows. Uh, at what point did Kayam enter into your watch list, or at what point did you increase scrutiny on how the business was doing? Michael? Yeah, um, you're absolutely right. The the company did have a history of loss making, but that in itself is is not a reason for us not to continue to support the company. And, and as Jane has said, we were working very closely with the company, meeting them very regularly. At each grant claim, we would look at uh, both the the entities here, the accounts of the entity here, Kayam in Livingston, but also the, the parent. And um, not unusually, as a startup. Uh, company, they were heavily dependent on the backing of their shareholders and indeed had quite a significant track record there that uh, raised some £45 million since the, uh, since the start of the acquisition of the company and had also sold uh, uh, various facilities, particularly one down in uh, Newton Aycliffe in England, to, to help out with the balance sheet. So um, we were reasonably clear, it wasn't the best set of financials by any means that we'd ever seen, but um, based on their track record both of the management team and their track record of actually raising cash. Uh, they also, the, the margins in the business were also gradually improving. Uh, sales had risen quite significantly, uh, both at, from Kayam Livingston, I think they, when the acquisition occurred, uh, they were standing at around four or five million. In 2018, that had risen markedly to 30 million uh, pounds. The corporation was even more significant than that. So uh, they were doing a lot of good things, the right things, increasing sales and volume. Uh, the yields from the machinery and the output of the factory was increasing um, through the SMAS work that we were doing. And as I say, gross profit and uh, net profit margins were moving in the right direction. So they were, were forecasting, uh, I think, uh, in, towards the end of 2018 to be uh, in a small, making a small profit, but perhaps a loss for the year overall. So given that background and given the, uh, the, the level of jobs, as I say, the level of growth and the forecast, everything seemed to be moving in the right direction, albeit slowly. Mm. So we, 
Did you challenge the company or talk to the auditors about the late filing of accounts? Not to the best of my knowledge. Okay. And final question, given what's happened, do you think the systems in place are robust enough, uh, generally and particularly in this company, uh, to uh, capture the early warning signals of companies in distress? Uh, my, my view is probably on balance. Um, and total out of the, I think as Neil said, out of the 408 offers we've made in the last uh, in the last five years, there have been some 30 write-offs. Uh, that's about four and a half million pounds from uh, 128 million pounds of, of grant. And given that we are in the risk-taking business, I think there's an argument to be made there that perhaps that's not sufficiently high. That uh, you know, we, we need, we are a, a funder of last resort. Uh, we. People come to us when they can't raise finance from elsewhere. So we, we are dealing with companies who, as I say, uh, have, have found that they can't raise finance in, in other places. And so we are in the riskier end of the market. Thank you. Angela, sorry. Yeah, yes. Just to, to add to that comment, um, it was just a sheer by way of background that mm. all of our customer-facing staff, our account managers who work with companies, have all gone through training uh, provided by Ernst & Young round about the ways in which you would identify signs of distress within businesses. So the reliance upon the individuals who have that relationship is particularly high. There's also a systematic approach whereby on a periodic, uh, peri uh, periodic timescale, we would go out and ask the company to confirm whether or not you know, they have any concerns around about future trading, etc. So there's a, a two-prong approach in place. Just to f ask that and follow up on the account, would that not be a red flag, a late filing of accounts? Is that not something that would kind of automatically uh, raise uh, concerns? It's a flag. It's not always a concern. It's something that happens um, more often than you, some people would possibly imagine. Mm. Among companies, sometimes there's very good reasons as to why, but I think it's always a flag for a conversation. And was that com than a, did that I conversation think. happen? I don't know. Yes, it did. The, 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 yes, I mean, and, and the 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 most recent sort of intensive uh, work done around about the claims, the RSA claims, uh, in March this year. Um, I mean, we're, we're we're we all will have the conversation, but the company were always and had a very strong track record of continuing to get private sector investment. Um, so at, the, at the point of a claim against the RSA, there is a formal review done of the business and the prospects for the business. So, so that's always done, uh, and that would be using more recent uh, uh, financial information and statutory accounts. If an account, uh, if a company is account managed, is it not automatically the case that you review certain issues and, and hygiene issues such as filing accounts? Uh, yes, we will. As, as, as Elaine said, it will be a, a, you know, a flag, but not necessarily a concern. But certainly, we, you know, that we will we'll, we'll have the conversation, and we had the conversation in this case uh, for last year in particular. Uh, we did have that that conversation with them. But again, it was, you know, they were all looking at the the future. There was continuing investment. There was still a viable a viable business. Okay. And can, final question. Sorry, can I ask what, what explanation did the company give for the late filing of accounts? Uh, they, uh, they were uh, there was a number of things that they wa they wanted to attend to before they before they uh, uh, did that. So you know there was it was only so far we could we could push, uh, but they they basically said that there were a number of issues that they they wanted to address uh, before they they finalised the accounts. So. And that explanation was uh, sufficient for, for your purpose? At, th at that time, it was sufficient, yes. Because they, they were ongoing and we were having formal reviews throughout the, light, the, the period of, of the RSA claim. So uh, th that because we, we were having those formal reviews, that was a, a additional assurance okay. uh, at that time. Okay. Convener, I think I'm drifting into other members' questions. Yes, Angela Constance, please. Thank you very much, Convener, and uh, good morning uh, to, to the panel. As you would appreciate, I'm the constituency MSP for Ammon Valley, and therefore, with the Convener's indulgence, I have a number of questions I wish to ask uh, this morning. I have a particular interest in public investment in a company uh, in my area that has paid off over 300 staff without any warning and without any pay before Christmas. Let me make clear that, uh, and for the record, that I want Scottish Enterprise to continue to invest in West Lothian. 
Uh, but given the history of this company and other companies in West Lothian who've benefited uh, from public uh, money and have at a later date uh, bailed uh, on the community, it's important uh, that my constituents and others receive maximum assurance about how public investment is used to anchor jobs uh, within a community. So therefore, I want to ask a number of questions around due diligence. Uh, given that Scottish Enterprise uh, serves a taxpayer as well as companies and the, 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 the job uh, creators, um, can you just outline what due diligence, the, the process uh, that you took in deciding to award uh, CAIAM £850,000 in RSC, uh, given that they have a history of laying their accounts late, they've done that for, for a number of years, that they hadn't made uh, any profit since uh, 2012. So what were the strengths of their application uh, that persuaded you to award £850,000? Um, primarily, uh, it's about uh, the, the counterfactual, if you like, um, which was if we hadn't funded this company and the acquisition of Gemfire uh, back in 2013, the plant would have closed. Uh, Gemfire were not in a position to sustain the investment and sustain the losses they were making. So on the back of the halls of Brock Broxburn uh, closure, uh, the opportunity for a company to acquire uh, Kayam and uh, safeguard 65 jobs, were not only safeguard 65, but to add a further 103 uh, was uh, of interest to us, and I'm sure to the constituents in, in West Lothian. Um, 80 of those jobs were entry-level jobs, so, uh, which was a further enhancement for us. So these were jobs that would be available to quite a wide range of people with a wide range of skills, not simply uh, technical skills. But in terms of the due diligence we undertake, um, as per all uh, RSA applications, we look at uh, principally five things. We undertake some uh, financial due diligence, looking at the accounts of the applicant uh, and the parent, where there is a parent. Uh, we, we're looking, obviously, for viability and for need for funding there. Uh, we look at the management team. Are they experienced in, uh, and skilled in this area? And uh, the management team are very much skilled in this area. Uh, the three principals there, the chief technology officer, the chief exec and the CFO, all had experience of dealing with small companies and small technology companies and raising money. So a very credible management team. Clearly, we look at the business plan. Uh, is is the business plan and the business, uh, does it have a credible and robust go-to-market plan? Are they taking uh, a new product to a new market, uh, which would be the highest risk uh, category? Or are they, in this case, taking an existing product to an existing market? The people involved very much knew the market very well. They had strong roots into it. Uh, and so that gave us comfort there as well. And finally, we look at the, uh, not finally, penultimately, we look at the sector. Uh, how, to what extent is the market in which they're hoping to sell into, is that growing? Uh, and at this particular time, and I think still now, uh, data centres for which this particular product is aimed at, those uh, Amazon and Google and Facebook all have these very large data centres, are growing considerably. So the market was growing. Um, so putting all of these things together, we, the final piece of due diligence we undertake is an economic impact assessment, uh, is the return that we are, the economy is going to get is that uh, uh, larger than the, the grant we are going to put in. In this particular case, they looked for some £850,000, and our uh, economic impact was uh, of the view that, yes, we would get a, a strong economic return. And I think it's also worth saying that um, we have done a, uh, a simple and initial uh, economic impact assessment of the position as it is so far, so looking at the employment and there's been some uh, that's been created in the past five years. There's some, uh, I think it's close to 600 people years worth of employment from Kayam. Uh, that, to the, if we look at the value that Kayam and that investment has created for, for Scotland and West Lothian, we've estimated it at about £42 million pounds per year. So uh, just simply based on the, the tax and national insurance returns, uh, the, our estimate is that uh, we've made a, we Scotland, the public uh, taxpayer, has has had a return of about four pounds for every pound that we've put in. 
So it is very regrettable um, for the people who've been made, re been made redundant. I've been made redundant, so I empathise that as well. Uh, but the, the, there has been a return. OK, I mean, thanks for that detailed answer. I mean, I understand uh, fully as, um, as someone who's local to West Lothian that the context of, of halls and the potential catastrophic impact that was facing uh, the local economy then and understand a bit about the history um, of Gemfire, although it may add salt to an open wound for people to think about uh, public money that was put into a rescue package, uh, post hauls, £29 million for that then to be invested in companies that have behaved uh, dishonourably. But I wonder, can you, can you tell me how much uh, Scottish Enterprise invested in Gemfire? I don't have those. You want to figures, so yeah, we, We'll, can, we'll uh, come back to him right now. I, I would be interested, you know, to to see the history of investment in the business, uh, as well as the the, the individual uh, companies. Can I turn to actually the history of the business? So I'm aware, um, as you've outlined, that um, that uh, you know this, this business began with Kaimata. Um, it was sold on to various uh, French interests. Uh, so when um, uh, Alcatel, the French company, sold to Avanex, it was described um, uh, as a process that was selling uh, the loss-making Octo Electronics unit. Um, I'm well aware of the history of Gemfire and the discussions I had with uh, Rick Tompany, the then Chief Executive, when they laid off uh, 170 uh, staff, but then bounced back a bit um, in, in 2009. We know that Kayam have not uh, made a profit since 2012, and we've heard about you know, the, the, the late accounts, that the habit of the late accounts. I just wonder where the history of this business figured in your due diligence. The, the history, I guess, we're um, new owners, essentially, we would look forward uh, rather than, than backwards. So, uh, the, And we always look at, well, what's the option if we don't fund a business? So if we hadn't funded and supported uh, the, the acquisition, then there would have been the closure of the factory and a further 65 jobs lost. So that's, that's, that is the counterfactual, that's the, the alternative. Yeah, I mean, I, I understand uh, the merits of a, a, a new broom coming in, and I, I certainly, um, as someone who would have been in contact with Scottish Enterprise uh, at the time of Gemfire's difficulties, mm. understand the bit about you know uh, protecting jobs is a crucial uh, part of, of, of what you do. Uh, but what I'm particularly interested in is how does the nature of this business inform your due diligence, given that when you look at the history, that this has been a site that has employed um, 65 staff, but also at one point employed uh, 450 staff. Uh, there was much volatility in Gemfire, paid off 170 staff, and then they bounced back a bit uh, the, the, you know, so, soon after when the market picked up. How well do your advisors understand this business? How niche is it? It's my understanding it, it provides a product to big uh, data customers, Google, Facebook, uh, Amazon. How well do you, you now and then understand the nature of this business? Because that has to figure. It isn't just about the new broom and the new faces and the new company and the facts as they stand. But there has to be that understanding of the history and the risks associated with this type of business. Um, that is something very much that we take into account. We essentially, um, if I can use the expression, the business model. Um, so if I, my interpretation of what you're asking is essentially, is there a credible business model? Could this industry actually uh, succeed and flourish in Scotland? And I, I think our view back then was yes, that uh, uh, like, um, if I can go back a little bit further to the NEC days, when NEC were in Livingston, uh, the, this is a, a similar type of operation. 
uh, making chips. What was needed was volume, essentially. So we had uh, Gemfire and Kayam were both suffering from uh, underinvestment in terms of equipment and equipment that could achieve very high volumes that could um, that could get to the market. So uh, when Kayam came along, we looked at the backgrounds of the chief exec and their, their plans were to bring back production uh, from China and, and laterally uh, also uh, bring in uh, production from America. So that is one of the issues that we, we took into account was, yes, this is going to be a change in the business model. The volumes are needed on the back of the investment and they had both the capability and by obviously bringing uh, back uh, a business from China to Scotland, that would very much help win that, uh, win that business and drive up the volumes. Likewise, their contacts with customers also would also ensure that on the sales side, those volumes could be achieved. So both from, I guess, a, a practical and a process perspective, the volumes that underpin this business model and this business were there, but also from a sales perspective, we, we also thought they could achieve those sales. Just, just to add to that, uh, I think you know this is a uh, fast-moving marketplace. It's technology-driven, and uh, it's always uh, going to be. Uh, all, there will always be risk inherent in participating in this marketplace. And I think you know we uh, undertake undertake our due diligence uh, to an appropriate level. Uh, we cannot always be. A fully expert in every field and also we take into account as Michael has said the other investors in the business so if you look at the level of funding we were providing uh, against the level of funding provided by private investors then uh, our investment was very small so there were others who uh, felt that there was a viable business here and over the piece have invested circa 45 million. So you know, you you take some element of of uh, comfort from the fact that others are also willing to in invest. So I mean, I understand that the global market in this area is very competitive, and I understand the points that Michael Caron has made about volume. But what the then chief executive uh, is now seeing now. You know, people can, you know, I have questions about, you know, the credibility now of his testimony given his behaviour towards the, the workforce. But what he is now saying is that uh, Google, Amazon, Facebook required high volume, but at very short notice, so therefore the business was unpredictable. What I want to know is that did Scottish Enterprise, on behalf of the taxpayer, understand the unpredictable nature of this business, whether you think this nature of this business is uh, un un unpredictable, um, and um, you know wh whether you were getting into that level of detail and understanding. So I think we understand it's an un unpredictable, fast-changing uh, uh, marketplace and, and all over the piece that those changes can happen very, very quickly. And I think, to reiterate, at the point that we took the decision uh, to offer the RSA grant, we were satisfied on the balance of risk. It was an appropriate uh, investment to make and that the prospects for the company uh, to a achieve a viable business were satisfactory. Okay, and is this business just at the mercy of Google, Amazon, Facebook, etc.? It's uh, well, obviously, the depending on the customers that they well they they had, then the 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 products that they had were very attractive to those operations, um, and the, but the demands in terms of. Uh, volume, etc., was escalating simply, you know, simply because of the, you know, the 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 needs in advancing technology, the speed of end to end in terms of data processing, the, the increasing uh, technological developments about the cloud. So these companies were very de are very demanding in terms of the scale and the volume, um, and. Uh, the, the the price pressures are caused by other entities maybe not providing us you know the that they were able they were moving into that space and they had there were larger companies the price pressure was was being driven down so it's uh, you know it's it's the it's the demands of, of technology that are that are the you know the companies are at their mercy of and nobody could predict 
you know, the, the, the speed of that, you know, from we've moved from to, to from analog to two G to three G, four G, five G in a very short time scale. And the companies like uh, Kayam are constantly trying to stay stay ahead of that. So it's the demands of the technology and the cost you know, the companies, these large businesses are all also competing with each other. So Okay, thanks. I want to move on to the conditions of the RAC award. Can you just confirm, has, has, did the company draw down all of the £850,000? Yeah. And the last uh, 100000 instalment uh, was when? Like March 2018. Mar yeah, so pretty, 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 pretty recent. Mm -hmm. um, can you just give us um, an overview of the conditions of RSA funding? the conditions that CAIAM were meant to be complying with, whether they've met these conditions and whether and how legally binding these conditions are? Yeah, the, the conditions are um, fairly standard uh, for all RSA grants that they must maintain the, the jobs and investment for a period, a number of years after the final payment, the date of the final payment. And in this particular case, it's three years after the, uh, the date of the final payment. So. Clearly, uh, Kayam are in breach of those conditions. There was also another condition that we uh, wanted a parental a company guarantee, and uh, that is in place. Uh, and so uh, we have written to the administrator uh, to seek uh, uh, claw back the, the grant. Um, we can't uh, put a figure on that yet, obviously, as the administrator hasn't finished uh, their job, so we won't know if we're likely to be paid fully from that or not, but in the event that we're not fully paid, we will also be exercising the calling in the parental company guarantee. Okay. Um, I appreciate that you're saying that they are now in breach of their conditions. Um, the issue that I raised with the uh, Scottish Government Ministers last week is I don't understand why they weren't in breach of their conditions uh, much earlier. I think it's very interesting that you see these conditions are, are pretty generic uh, to, to, to all companies. Um, it, it, it cannot possibly be right. I would contend you, you may have a view that for uh, an award to be made of up to £850,000 at the end of 2013, and yet um, almost a year later, staff are actually being paid off, 20 full-time staff, and of course some temporary staff were also paid off, 60 staff in total. Surely that's a, an early warning sign, if not a breach of condition. Well, the, the contract we have or had with Kayam was for the safeguarding of 65 and the creation of 103 jobs. Um, uh, they quickly exceeded that, and I think at the, the peak were over well over 400 jobs. So uh, obviously, we combining the 65 and 103 would get you to 168, but uh, for a number of years, they had well exceeded that, and unfortunately, at the closure, they were still uh, exceeding that at, I think, 345, 350. So there was, uh, in that sense, they were honouring the contract. They had exceeded the job targets and investment, uh, and so they had met the conditions thereafter. Uh, so that's during the project. Once the project is finished and the project finishes with the final payment, they then move into this post-conditions period, or not post-conditions, but post-project period, where they have to maintain that investment in those jobs. So the, from our perspective, during the build-up of the project, the life of the project, they had exceeded what we had contracted with them for. So they weren't in breach of the contract. So it, it, it must be true then that Scottish Enterprise in any award of RSE will tolerate a level of job losses? Um, in, in general, yes. Right, okay, that might be, that'll be something that I'll uh, certainly come back to. Um, just to clarify that, I mean, uh, we set out in terms of the award a number of uh, milestones that have to be met from the start of the project to the end, and then, as Michael has said, the conditions uh, period. And against each of those, then you make a payment. So for each payment milestone, there is usually a capital investment figure to be achieved by the company. 
that is verified usually by an independent auditor's certificate and obviously uh, a jobs figure. So throughout the period of the grant, then those are always have to be maintained. No, I understand the process that you've out outlined um, and uh, I, I appreciate the information that you've given to committee, but it appears uh, true that in any RSC award, that a level of job losses uh, can can be can be tolerated. Can I ask? Uh, did Kayam ever sign the Scottish Business Pledge? So no, they they didn't do that. They did meet six of the nine characteristics of Scottish Business Pledge in terms of the way in which they operated as a business, but they didn't opt to sign up to Scottish Business Pledge. Okay. And uh, what consideration have you given to um, businesses being signed up to the Business Pledge as part of RSA conditions? So not specific to RSA conditions, but over the course of probably at least the past two and a half years, we've had quite a strong focus on making sure that we engage with all account managed companies, that they understand why the business pledge and, and particularly the characteristics which it conveys are particularly important to them being a forward thinking employer, to being a fair employer, and actually the benefits which that brings back to their business and, and operation and market engagement, which is the really key bit for them to do that. So we have at least one, if not more, conversations specifically relating to business pledge with every account managed company. And we've been monitoring engagement with that portfolio um, over the period of the last two years. And we've seen improvements coming through in most areas. Um, there are some areas which are have a lower uptake overall than others, and we've been focusing on that to, to try to increase that. In terms of actual sign-up, that's down to the individual company. So again, we encourage, we, we don't dictate that they should do that. We say that it's a welcome thing for them to do, that it presents a positive endorsement of their commitment to Scotland and it actually helps to can help to attract other staff to come and work with them. But for various different reasons, different companies have chosen not to do so. We've supported Scottish Government during 2017 on the review of Business Pledge and thinking about how that may play forward. OK, thanks. Uh, it sounds as if more needs to be done to persuade uh, companies uh, of the business case for signing up to the, the, the Business Pledge and how fair work makes uh, good business sense. Um, can I move on to uh, two sl slightly different uh, issues. The first one is that committee has received evidence from uh, a company who supplied CAIAM. Um, and of course, much of the focus over Christmas has been on the, the, the CAIAM workforce, uh, but we shouldn't forget those in the, the, the supply chain. So we have received evidence from um, a small company who uh, placed purchase orders issued that, that were issued for November and December. Purchase orders were issued for November and December. Um, and uh, this company then, like everybody else, found out um, you know, that Kayam had contacted Companies House to advise that they would be stopping trading at the end of December. Uh, yet this company was still issued with purchase orders. And as a result of these not being ordered, this uh, you know, small company has had to let three members of staff go. Um, and I wondered if you could speak to any role you have in terms of the support in the supply chain, uh, but also uh, the issue about uh, who, who is alerted uh, and, and when, given the consequences of lack of information, lack of knowledge. Absolutely. So one of the key things when um, any company faces this situation is to understand the wider impact across the Scottish supply chain uh, base. And we then work so with Scottish Enterprise, with the administrators, with the local authority and business gateway to engage with companies who are impacted by any significant hit on that. Now, that comes at different sizes. If you have a large employer um, and you have a neighbouring provision of cafe facilities, for instance, then not having a footfall of 300 or so individuals is hugely significant. Um, we may not always see that on something that would be a supply chain breakdown that would come from the administrators. What we would typically see are the actual purchase order commitments that come through. We received information from KPMG last week because they're going about the course of understanding the, the situation that the company was in and we're now working with West Lothian Council to ensure that we make contact with parties who've been affected. Okay, thank you. And if I can uh, finish where I started, uh, convener, uh, I want Scottish Enterprise to continue to invest wisely uh, in West Lothian. Um, 
We heard from the Minister last week that uh, there are in excess of 20 uh, interested potential buyers. Um, I'm interested in knowing uh, more about your role in identifying uh, suitable uh, buyers and what support you would be able to offer any potential buyer. Yes, um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very much... Uh, our role to do that. We had already provided a summary to KPMG of the types of things that we can do. We also have reached out actively to our networks um, through uh, SDI in terms of uh, looking at what the, the, uh, the, the nature of the, the business, identifying contacts and names. KPMG are wanting to manage and control that process, which is absolutely uh, 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 right, if, uh, right and correct. So we are providing and feeding in to that process uh, using our own networks and identifying names of businesses at senior level globally um, to try and uh, input to that, uh, to that list, but also actively follow up and, and be open to following up and being involved in any meetings, conversations, calls with any interested parties to identify what their interest is, because the priority is to look at, go, you know, that's the priority is going concern in some way. Um, so, uh, uh, and absolutely applying all of the, the sort of team approach that we, we have throughout the, the situation with Kayam to any other investor that is, uh, whether it's existing or, or new to Scotland, to encourage them to, to invest and, and, to, and uh, uh, work with us to do that. And we're working with KPMG, engaging with them on a regular basis. Uh, I think we've got a, another another call with them this week just to talk about that. Sorry, Jane. Just to quantify, over half of the um, opportunities that KPMG are now working with have been put forward to them as a result of us reaching out to our networks for potentially interested parties. Um, KPMG also have their own networks and, and supplement that. When we spoke at the end of last week, they had over 20 interests. There was a further four that we put forward to them today. What they're trying to work through are which of those interests are in relation to a going concern, which are in relation to specific functions of the business, mm. and ultimately and only um, when no other options continue, which of them are in relation to the assets okay. which may be acquired from the business. Their focus is entirely around about the opportunities for a going concern at the current time. They want to conclude that process by the end of January. So it's not a finite timescale, but that's the indicative timescale that they're currently working So how many of those who've expressed an interest are interested in purchasing the company as a going concern? Yeah, they haven't given us the specific number, but they have said a reasonable number um, for an, a going concern, both from UK, US and China. So that's where the interests are coming from. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kavira. Thank you. Um, Colin Beattie. Thank you, Vera. I'm interested in the, obviously the fact that uh, Kayam breached the terms of the of the grant. Where do I presume you're trying to recover the full amount of the grant? Is there any additional sums that you would try and no penalties? So it's uh, just it's just the grant itself. Just the grant itself, yeah. Where does uh, Scottish Enterprise uh, stand and or, or more correctly rank in terms of the creditors of the company? We're unsecured. Yeah. Unsecured? Yes. Would it not be normal to take some security if it's available? Or word the agreement in such a way that you have a, a certain ranking, as, as would any other lender? So I've, I think uh, I'm not a legal expert, so, so we may come back and, and, and provide some, some clarification on this. But of course, uh, the grant isn't a loan, mm. so it, it, it shouldn't, I think, or could be treated the same way as lending. But so it carries a legal liability for the company. It carries I've, a financial I've, liability to the company it's until a conditional, three years. Yes. yes, it's a conditional liability. I'm not sure uh, how it's presented in companies' accounts. I don't think it's shown as, as a, a conditional liability in companies' accounts, but... I say I'm, I'm not an expert on, on this. And of course, we, we have to balance uh, our position that we do not want to get in the way of the company using normal lending as part of, of its funding requirements. Now, you said you had a parent company guarantee. 
presumably that's the company in the US. Yes. yes. Uh, what due diligence was carried out on that parent company in accepting the guarantee? Uh, well, we, we can come back to the details, but uh, basically uh, we ask for um, uh, confirmation from a, a, a lawyer that uh, they have the ability to make that, and it also we look for board uh, for the the parent company's board to to sign uh, an affidavit that they are able to to make the parent company guarantee. I can come back to you with the fuller details of the the due diligence that we undertake there. No. Having, having that guarantee is obviously a comfort, but it's only good as long as the financial health of the parent company is there. How, what process do you have for following up on that subsequently? In terms of? In terms of the financial uh, position of the parent company. Well, at, uh, at I mean, every claim stage, uh, we review both the well, applicants' uh, Well, accounts. we're not talking really at the claim stage here because You've taken a parent guarantee, and that parent guarantee clearly was required because you felt that the financial health of the underlying company here was not of a standard. Therefore, you wanted the comfort of a parent company guarantee. At the time you took that guarantee, you would have done a due diligence on the, the ability of that company to meet that obligation. Mm -hmm. But as we see from the company here, situations change. How do you ensure that where you receive a guarantee, and it's not necessarily just with CAM, how, yeah. do you how do you ensure that that guarantee is still worth the paper it's written on? Well, I think the simple answer is we can't in every case. I mean, a simple thing like uh, due diligence, looking at their accounts, for example, maybe every year, yeah. that sort of thing. Well, uh, is there a process? Yeah, that's, that's what I was saying. So at the claim stage... At the claim stage, but on an ongoing basis. I mean, the company guarantee could be there over a number of years. Well, I threw the, our account management with the company. So, if if Kayam hadn't entered administration, um, we would be looking at the on, on a yearly basis. We would be looking at the uh, the accounts of the of the uh, the company that we're account managing and its parent. So, so you have would, a process for yeah, for, a, for part doing of that. our regular review. Yes. When did the parent company sign the guarantee? Oh, I'd have to come back to you on that. Because I'd be interested to know whether it was yeah. some years ago and what due diligence has been carried ago, out in yeah. the interim to try and find out what the yeah. prospects are of actually getting that money back. Yeah. Can I ask, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think uh, a statement was made that about there's, over the last five years there's been about 30 write-offs, uh, 30 to 40 million pounds. Uh, no, was four and a half million pounds. Four and a half million pounds, million pounds. okay. Um, how many of these companies failed to meet the conditions of their funding and have there been any instances where you've uh, tried to claw back the grants and either succeeded or failed? Yep, we would have to write to you with that, those details. I don't have the figures with me, uh, but we have, in, I think in all instances, we will have attempted uh, to reclaim the money. Okay. Between yourself and Kayam, how much communication have you had with the company in relation to the grant? Over what period? Uh, since, the, since the firm went into administration, or has all the communication been with the, uh, the people that are handling the... the Administrators, yes, yeah. since the administration, yes. So you've had nothing direct with the company? Since the, administ yeah. the, the administrators, that you know, it's, it's KPMG that we're really hissing with now. Have you, have you advised the parent company that their guarantee may require to be called? Yes. yes. You have. So you've gone through that legal process. There's obviously some legal costs are going to be involved in this, especially if you're dealing with a US company. So at the moment, we've written to advise that we will seek to call on the parental uh, guarantee. So that's not... That doesn't really have too much of a cost associated with it. But if we were to pursue, then you are absolutely right. Okay. Um, what, what, have you had a response back whether the parent company is going to honour that guarantee or not? No response as yet, Jim. And when, will, when did you write to the parent uh, last company? Last week. I mean, the, you've got the conditions for paying out the grant, but... Mm -hmm. Your comment that, in fact, there's 
you can't ensure a guarantee is worth more than the paper it's written on. That was my understanding, Mr. Cannon, of your response yeah. to one of the questions. I don't think I quite said that. What I well, said was yes, uh, was <laughs> what I said. Uh, in it, not in every case can a uh, parent company continue to exist. So in some cases, uh, as we're seeing, some uh, subsidiaries enter administration and parent companies enter administration. Uh, where we seek to get a parent company guarantee where we can, but it's not in the, it's not, uh, we don't like to think that it's it's uh, a magic bullet that will save us. It's a, a good to have uh, when we can get it. But but it might, as I think you've said, yeah. not be worth any more than from the, yeah. the company itself in these yeah. sorts of circumstances. So do you not seek bank guarantees from such companies, for example, that would be worth whatever they're granted to? Uh, not, we haven't uh, explored that avenue, not to the best of my knowledge. What avenues have you explored then in terms of...? Well, principally we've used bank, uh, their parent company guarantees. Right, there's a couple of follow-up questions. Gordon MacDonald, Jackie Bailey and Andy Whiteman. Um, very quick question. Um, at the time of Gemfire Corporation being taken over by Kayam, uh, it was owned by GC Holdings. The chair of, sorry, the president and chief executive of GC Holdings then became the chairman of Kayam. Is that an unusual situation? Um. And did that ring alarm bells that? somebody that was an investor in one company was then moving on to invest in the second company? At, at the point of acquisition of any company, it's fairly common to retain someone um, who knows enough about the history to do that. I, I couldn't quantify that for you, but from other companies that we've worked with, I certainly have seen that in practice. Now, what you often see is that that only exists for a defined period of time, and then as transition takes place, they'll, they'll change that arrangement, but I can't give you a specific for it. So it's not unusual, it wouldn't ring any alarm bells? It, it, does, it does happen in other cases. I think what we would look at, as Michael alluded to, is the overall strength of the new management team mm -hmm. for uh, the potential company who's looking for our public sector support to think collectively, does that give sufficient confidence in the way in which they want to take the business forward? Uh, so it's very rarely about one individual, it tends to be about a, a collective. Okay. Jackie Bailey. In response to a question from Colin Beattie, you said that um, you always attempted to reclaim money. Is there a standard process for doing this? And I appreciate you might not be able to think back 10 years, but in the last year, have you reclaimed any money? Have you been successful? And how much? Again, I, I'm sorry, I don't have those figures at the top of my head. Well, you were coming here to a committee meeting that we were yeah. going to explore clawback. I think that was self-evident yes. from what we said in public record, and you don't have the figures. You can't remember in the last year what's happened. Uh, well, that's the reclamation side of the business. It's not my part of the business, I'm Who's afraid. It? Uh, it's a, a colleague's. So I uh, apologise uh, that we have met your expectations of that, and we will write to you following today's meeting. What I would say is uh, the... Uh, Kind of cases, I think, fall into a number of different categories. So you have categories such as the one we're talking about today, where the company fails or goes into administration, and you can understand reclaiming or, 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 or being able to secure repayment of our grant can be quite challenging in those situations because the company no longer is trading and has limited uh, resources for dispersal. In other cases, you'll, you'll have companies that are have changed their mind or changed strategic direction and are no longer completing a project. I think, uh, and hopefully when we look at the data, it'll confirm our track record of reclaiming in those situations is is actually quite good. But we'll can, come back can, to you with all that can, detail. Can I just ask, I mean, f leaving aside the detail, okay, have you reclaimed any money this year? Do the year past, 2018, any money at all? You, you, I don't need pounds, shillings and pence. I just need to know, have you reclaimed any? I'm afraid, Jackie, I do not know the answer oh my goodness me. to that. I apologise. Andy Whiteman. Thanks very much, convener, and thank you 
for coming in at um, um, short notice. Um, in a letter from, of the 31st of December, the Minister, Jamie Hepburn, provided us with a timeline, uh, provided all uh, MSPs with a timeline, and that indicated that on the 16th of November, Scottish Enterprise were notified during a phone call uh, that the company was in financial difficulty. What exactly was the financial difficulty that was intimated at that stage? Yes, it was the, that they had been experienced severe price pressures that they had were having severe uh, um, cash flow problems and as a result of uh, multiple factors that they were seeking a buyer uh, at that time. So those were the kind of the, the major the headlines in terms of the call um, and that it was a, you know, it, it was a, had been a very quickly emerging situation and that they were doing everything that they possibly could to secure a sale of the business. So you mentioned cash flow then. Were any was, was any indication given of how much cash flow the company had on the 16th of November? The, not, not, not that. It was, a, it was a call. It was obviously notifying us of the situation. And obviously then we start to engage and mobilise and, you know, go into get, get into sort of greater detail. So in terms of the overall uh, uh, losses that they, they were experiencing, uh, we, we uh, uh, you know, the, the, the fact was that they were uh, going through a, a period of severe cash flow issues and that they were seeking a sale of the business and they were, they were doing it very urgently. So, uh, but in terms of the scale, uh, we were, we, uh, it's over the next few days that we, we, uh, we, we worked that through. Okay, thank you. And then on the 22nd of November, ministers were briefed, I think for the first time o o on the difficulties. What, what are the general criteria um, that Scottish Enterprise adopt in relationship to when, what triggers, uh, briefing ministers on a situation like this? As soon as we know uh, in terms of the, the the scale and understand the detail of it, that is when we, we trigger it. It's uh, Sometimes it's, it's, it's uh, a, you know, we, we need a, a few a few days in terms of to, to crystallise what the situation was, to mobilise the team, to sort of look at the ask in terms of, you know, if, if there's any support that could be provided. So it's, it's as soon as possible. Uh, there, there's, uh, uh, and, and when we understand the, this, this, the scale of, of the issue properly, uh, so it's as soon as that, that's when we'll, we'll, we'll trigger the briefing to ministers. You see, sorry, the specific criteria um, where there's a significant opportunity or loss. So something typically in the region of more than 50 FTEs are involved yes. in it. That's the, the baseline by which. Um, it's appropriate. Now, where that will vary is if you're in a locality which has a specific sector or, uh, you know, kind of a, a tougher regional impact. So it, it does flex. It's not a defined line, but that's the, the baseline. Okay, that's very helpful. Thanks very much. Um, and on the 6th of December, um, in the timeline, there's a note, NB, Scottish Enterprise also notified ministers that it had declined a request for funding of six to eight million pounds on risk grounds, what was that request for funding in, it in was to, designed to achieve? Basically, it was to, I mean, you know, it's looking at uh, bridging finance to maintain the business to, towards uh, securing a, a a sale. So, and we were, you know, in terms of the, you know, the 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 that's the 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 whole situation and what the company we were looking to do changed substantially over a very short period of time. So that figure changed again because they had, they had it successfully secured an element of, of uh, you know, in terms of their, uh, you know, the, the financing that they were, they were seeking. So they were constantly, absolutely looking to, to achieve a, a positive outcome themselves uh, in, in this scenario. So, but we didn't have a kind of a, a, an investable, you know, a case on which that we could, uh, given the risks involved in the, the financial situation, that we could actually apply a sort of that that kind of, uh, you know, to, to support them at that stage. There was no investable uh, case. So it was it was just on. too risky, and there wasn't yeah. just wasn't at a case. At that point, yes. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> On the 7th of, Nef of December, following a call between Scottish Enterprise officials and the Chief Executive Officer and the Chief Financial Officer of CAIAM, ministers were advised, I assume it says ministers advised, that the company had around seven days 
of cash flow. Ministers were briefed on that. If the cash flow was, if they had no more than a week's money, why, why in general terms, was that not picked up on earlier? Clearly that lay behind the phone call of the 16th of November, but between the 16th of November and the 7th of December, three weeks or so, um, I'd expect cash flow concerns to be being raised in management accounts, I don't know, sometime in the summer? Or is that just, is, is the business just not the kind of business that could actually predict its cash flow? Yeah, I think there was, they were, they were constantly uh, on a track record of securing investment. So it wasn't as, as you know, as, as, as much of an issue as it might be in other circumstances uh, because of that. And, uh, so the and the the, the timescales that you, you refer to the company were continuing, um, and the situation in terms of the you know the the the, the what they were looking to do and the the the, the investment they were seeking to secure they were con they were continuing to to reach out to investors to uh, address the challenges that they were having but in order to ensure a sale. So there was uh, in terms of the, uh, the there was no kind of stimulus if you like to. Uh, you know, to cause a concern at that time, because as well we were talking to them about other investment, you know, genuine investment uh, op opportunities. Uh, so um, the, 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 there was there was really no uh, concern to you know of, of, this, of this of you know that would suggest any to any level of the, of the scale that it turned out to be. But um, forgive me, so I don't manage large companies, but. Um, Investment wouldn't normally underpin cash flow. It would normally be day-to-day -day trading in which forecasts are made about the market and about sales and about costs um, and whether you have the cash available. And there could be timing issues there in relationship to payment and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. um, so I, don't, I don't quite understand why um, investment is necessarily part of the explanation as to why the ran out of money. Yeah, I, I think the the ongoing challenges that we're having in the the market, the, the reducing the, the reducing level of sales, uh, the you know the, the the price pressures that they were suffering. It was a it was a it was it was a very complex uh, and fluid situation. Clearly, that the company were do, making every effort to address themselves before they they came to to, to us, uh, and we we had sort of the, the the more detailed conversation in November. Okay, thank you. Um, so how many meetings has Scottish Enterprise had um, since the 16th of November with the chief executive and or other senior yeah. staff members of CAIAM? There were four or five conference calls because obviously they were travelling you know, globally, doing mm -hmm. everything again. There were, there were four or five conference calls as well as a face-to-face -face in the, I think it was about the 19th of December with, uh, uh, with, with partners as well. So... Uh, but they were, and they were all with either the chief exec or the, 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 the chief financial officer during that, that period of time. And was there, uh, can you characterise the, um, their, uh, uh, did, I mean, they, did they find, did you, did you think that they found this all surprising or? Was there an indication that they had been anticipating that these circumstances might have arisen now well, for some it, time? It definitely was a, a circumstance of you know multiple factors that they built. The the our understanding is they, they they wanted to address themselves. It was really just the the timing and the scale happened escalated very quickly, and they were the 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 behaviour was to that the, that they were confident that they would be able to to secure. Uh, what they needed in order to be able to, to, to sell the business. Okay, thanks. That was, the, that was the message. On the, going back to the question of the, the employees and the, the Scottish Business Pledge, I think you said that the, that Kaim had not signed up to the Scottish Business Pledge. When grant assistance is given in terms of the conditions set, is there a sort of minimum in terms of conditions that you would set regarding how uh, an employer treats the employees and the, the workforce? Um, I'm, 
I'm not sure we have that ability to dictate how a, a company can treat its workforce. We do encourage them to sign the Scottish Business Pledge, uh, and, and going forward, we we're hoping to incorporate other conditions such as the, the real living wage into uh, into it being an entry criteria for support, a condition for support. But at the moment, uh, we. Uh, we well, I, w I wasn't yeah. suggesting you can yeah. dictate to any yeah. company yeah. how they treat their workforce. Yeah. I was asking whether or not you have a sort of minimum um, approach a company you would consider would have to take towards its workforce or evidence as to how it conducts itself with its workforce before you give the conditional grant assistance. And can you give me an example of what a condition? That well, work terms and conditions whether they have full-time employees, part-time employees, how many, how they approach these sorts of issues, mm -hmm. job security? Uh, I think, not in, in, the simple answer is not, not in particular. We look at, at the business plan uh, and the, the sector they're in. Uh, it, it is a competitive market, so companies, that essentially, if they want to grow and, and flourish, they need to be treating their, their workforce uh, well, otherwise the, the business plan won't be executed. So you assume that? I think we generally have the discussion with them around their workforce and the characteristics that sit behind the business pledge and I clearly uh, advocate, as, as has been said today, the uh, positive business benefits of, of fair work practices. That, that, that would be all part of our normal engagement of working with companies. Uh, uh, the question comes is, you know, would you conditional, make that conditional of, and I think at the moment we're saying we don't make that a condition of our assistance. Our approach is very much to engage and, and uh, win the argument about the benefits of, of adopting such practices. And with regard to Kayam, did you engage in such discussions, arguments? Yes, on the certainly on the the business pledge, uh, that was uh, you know part of the you know the ongoing agenda of discussing with them. So, um, yes, I mean it's it's part of the you know what what we what we do in terms of the the account management approach and and the fair work agenda that we're we're obviously applying in the, in our discussions with companies that we support. But you don't look at the detail of how the workforce is made up or the conditions the employees work on when you look at the question of grant assistance. So um, maybe just to expand a little bit on that, we have um, different specialists who focus on areas. I think it was alluded to earlier that Scottish Manufacturing Advisory Service has engaged on four uh, different project activities with CAIAM. Now, when they are looking at their activities, it's not just about physical layout, it's also about how you use your people, how you're maximising them. And linked to that, we have something called a workplace innovation uh, specialist, and they are also engaged in those conversations around how you get the best performance, how do you improve productivity through making sure that you're being the best employer that you can be um, for those employees. It doesn't go as far as to within the conditions of a grant to say that you must do these things, but these are normal uh, conversations that we would have with any company and indeed did have with Kayam. Jackie Bailey. Two very quick questions, if I may, convener. Um, is it correct then for me to say that prior to the 16th of November, there were no reports to the Scottish Government about any problems at Kayam because you were effectively blindsided by what they told you? Uh, there, yes, there was no prior uh, communication with Scottish Government, certainly. OK, so you didn't anticipate that these problems were happening and, and so you were blindsided by them. Um, can I ask, I mean, did, did you ask the company at any point, or indeed did the Scottish Government, to inform the workforce or any contractors? Because I can't believe that you would knowingly allow workers to work on in the knowledge or in contractors to engage in new contracts in the knowledge that they wouldn't be paid. Did you ask the company um, to inform their contractors and their workforce? It was really just a company decision. I mean, we we were the, the, the right up into the wire that we're clearly looking to find a positive outcome here. Uh, so, uh, and there was a, you know, it's just what the company really, it, it was their responsibility to to uh, you know, to do that, and and their their decision, uh, and as I say, because they were looking to 
find a positive outcome right up to the wire. Sure, but, it but, wasn't but you were much. told on the 21st of December there may be a delay of a week in paying salaries. Then you were told the following day the salaries wouldn't be paid at all. Um, did you tell the company to tell its workforce or its contractors? Because people worked on. I mean, we, 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 asked, we asked the question, you know, just you know, uh, in terms of what the, you know, what the plans would be. So they would just manage, manage through, and the, but the intention was to be able to meet their obligations. And that was, the, I, that was the, the response. I suppose knowing that they weren't going to pay people, I would have expected you not to ask but demand that they share that information with workers who were going in or contractors who were engaging in contracts in good faith, knowing that they wouldn't be paid. We uh, really we didn't know that they wouldn't be paid right. At, right. You know, we, we found out the of same as, as the same as as, as everyone else. So. On the nineteenth of December, um, there was a I think it's the nineteenth of December. Mm -hmm. If I've got the dates right, there was a meeting that took place where we invited Pace colleagues to come and join a conversation with the company to remind them of their responsibilities, but also to make them aware of uh, the support that would be available and to say that if there were difficulties, the sooner you can engage, the sooner the employees know, the sooner that we can widen out the other opportunities that exist. So a conversation did take place with Pace in the 19th round about that topic. I, I wasn't there, so I can't see whether it addressed but the specific points. I suppose my point, convener, I'll leave it at this. On the 22nd, they knew for definite that people weren't being paid. They still went into their work. They still engaged in contracts, and nobody told them. Thank you, convener. And what what is Scottish Enterprise role with regard to the the several hundreds of workers who have lost their jobs as a result of CAIAM? So we work with West Lothian Council, uh, Skills Development Scotland, and Department for Work and Pensions. The key role that we have here is to identify through companies that we work with vacancies which are there at the moment or business growth opportunities which we can help to accelerate to bring to uh, to fruition where there is a job creation opportunity there. Through that, we identified in the course leading up to Christmas, um, or on Christmas Eve, essentially, uh, over 100 vacancies, details of which were passed to SDS and to PACE. We're now working with PACE to support the jobs fair, which is taking place on Thursday of this week in Bathgate, and we'll continue to engage in that process to, to see where opportunities can exist. The predominant lead on that now rests with PACE to take that work forward. Right, thank you. Um, are there any other questions from committee members? If not, thank you very much for coming in and I'll suspend the meeting and we'll move into private session.